Hello, 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 and welcome once again to Movies That Pop. I'm the Colonel. Let's see what popped up in theaters this week. A Monster Calls is a non-stop parade of misery. Let's just start with that. The main character, Connor O'Malley, is dealing with bullies at school, an absentee father who doesn't really seem to want to spend any more time with him than he has to, a rigid grandmother, and worst of all, a single mother who's probably the most likable character in the film, so it's really too bad that she's, uh, you know, dying of cancer, as Marty McFly would say, heavy. That's heavy. And that heaviness just sort of hangs over the entire movie, this prolonged grief that affects everyone in Connor's life. It also allows Connor to act out seemingly with no consequences, whether verbally or violently. This kid treats everybody but his mother uh, kind of terribly. So even the protagonist of A Monster Calls is unlikable, even though he does have our sympathy. His parents forgive him, school administration forgives him, and we, the audience, are supposed to forgive him some pretty major transgressions because, you know, shh, he's, uh, he's just going through a lot right now. I know, it's kind of messed up. And one of the movie's numerous truths, if you will, is that Connor recognizes that it's kind of messed up, and he's troubled by it as well. He should be punished for some of the things he does and says. He even kind of waits eagerly to be punished. He stares down the school bully in class in a way that almost suggests he has a crush on the bully and just stands there unresisting as he gets violently assaulted day after day. He's dealing with some pretty majorly heavy truths about life and complicated emotions and the world doesn't seem to make a bit of sense. One night, whether literally or only in his imagination, he summons the monster of the title, voiced by Liam Neeson and resembling Groot so much it's a miracle Disney hasn't sued. The monster, whose name is only Monster. Oh, also, incidentally, most of the characters in the end credits don't have names of their own. They're just defined by their relationship to Connor, like mom, dad, grandma, the head teacher, etc. Anyway, the monster appears one night in the form of a tree in a cemetery outside his window, brought on by a pretty harrowing recurring nightmare that the boy had been having of late. The monster promises to tell Connor, a Christmas Carol style, three stories over the course of a few days that will help him understand things if, at the end, Connor tells the monster all about the nightmare that he's had and the horrible truth it reveals about how Connor is really feeling. Now this is all pretty heavy stuff and a monster calls is daring and nuanced in a way that I wasn't expecting. Connor is at an age that I'd say is just about the target audience, or as the monster calls him, too old to be a boy, too young to be a man. And the movie deals in very subtle fashion with themes and emotions that he can't fully grasp or understand. And the movie doesn't always do it successfully. This monster is either an independent, godlike force in the universe sent to help Connor cope, or he's just a manifestation of Connor's subconscious trying to work out what he's experiencing. But either way, he's kind of a dick, man. I wrestled with this movie for a long time, and in the end, came out more impressed and moved a few days later than I did when I first walked out of the theater. In the moment, I felt disconnected from Connor's journey because of how terrible he was acting towards people and how terrible people were acting towards him. I was puzzled by some awkward shifts in character arcs that didn't feel earned or organic to the story, and I absolutely hated this advice given from the dying mom to her son. And if you need to break things, by God, you break them. Oh, he breaks them all right. He breaks them real good. And he does it in a way that I don't think we should be encouraging little children. I also hated Sigourney Weaver's attempt at a British accent and the third act revelation of what Connor's dream really means, seemingly what the entire movie is about, it kind of fell flat for me before I had a chance to think about it. I did appreciate the visual panache of the monster's storytelling sequences, which are animated in a style that reminded me of the tale of the three brothers sequence from Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows part one. But I confess, you know, uh, when I first saw it in theaters, I didn't quite get it. However, I couldn't stop thinking about it either. Looking back now, I appreciate the nuance a lot more. Although the scope of the story is still incredibly narrow, I find the story more affecting now in the abstract as a whole than I did in the moment when I was watching it. I think now, upon reflection, that I walked into the film expecting a different film than I ultimately got, and as a result, it was hard for me to appreciate at the time. Because what I got was a brutally, and I do mean brutally, honest depiction of how children attempt to comprehend the incomprehensible and the fall from grace we all experience when we grow up, when we begin to see the world for what it is, and our parents as real people with real flaws. I'm gonna end up giving a monster called a large bag of popcorn. It's not for everybody, and especially it's not for young children. But it is an experience that is intense and unforgiving, and in the end, quite lovely. Quite lovely. Well, that does it for this edition of Movies That Pop. Don't forget to follow me, the Colonel, on Twitter at Movies That Pop. And click the icon right down there to visit our channel if you'd like to see more, and support us by clicking subscribe while you're there, and by clicking the thumbs up icon below. I'd like to hear your thoughts on a monster calls in the comments below as well. In the meantime, thanks for watching. I'm the Colonel, and if you need to break things, then by God, you break them.